N.W.A. was one of the most legendary West Coast rap groups of all time. But even though they made history together, bad contracts and creative differences turned them into enemies, leading to some of the wildest diss tracks in rap history. Here's a look at the sad downfall of N.W.A. and where it all went wrong. Even though they were all from Compton, the members of N.W.A. did not grow up making music together. It all started in the late 80s with a local dealer named Eric Wright, aka Easy e Easy was making good money hustling, and by 22, he already stacked around $250,000. But after seeing his cousin get shot, he wanted to find a way out of the streets and go legit. At the time, rap was just starting to get popular with groups like Run DMC and the Beastie Boys making waves. So Easy wanted to get in on the action and started recording songs in his parents' garage. But Easy E knew he needed to build a team if he wanted to get any real buzz in the music industry. He wanted to start a record label, but he knew he needed a manager to help him take care of the business side. Easy was cool with a dude named Alonzo Williams, who was a local DJ and promoter that owned a club called Eve After Dark. Alonzo also managed a few different groups like the World Class Wrecking Crew and CIA, which included future NWA members like Dr. Dre, DJ Yella, and Ice Cube. Easy knew Alonzo had connections in the music industry, so he paid him $750 to introduce him to a man named Jerry Heller. Jerry was a big name in the industry and managed famous acts like Marvin Gaye, Black Sabbath, and Journey. But Jerry was also interested in rap and wanted to get more involved in the hip-hop scene. At the time, he was working with CIA and the World Class Wrecking Crew, but being a white Jewish man from Ohio, he wasn't tapped in with the culture. So when he met Easy e Jerry saw the perfect opportunity. Easy pulled up to his office with his friend MC Ren, who was also a rapper from the same gang, the Cali Park Compton Crips. Easy barely said a word to Jerry at the meeting, but played him as single boys in the hood. Jerry was immediately shocked by Easy's raw and unfiltered rapping style and knew he was going to be a star. So, Jerry agreed to help Easy start Ruthless Records and invested $250,000 for a 20% cut in the business. But even though he had the raw talent, Easy was still pretty inexperienced as a rapper and needed a solid production team to help him work on his sound. So that's when Easy was introduced to Dr. Dre through another dude named Steve Yano, who used to sell mixtapes at a local swap meet. Dre knew about Easy's reputation in the neighborhood and thought he had star potential, so he agreed to help him work on music. They also recruited another artist named Arabian Prince to help with the production. But even though Easy had the style and wild stories from his days selling drugs in Compton, he still needed to perfect his bars. So, they also recruited Ice Cube to help ghostwrite lyrics. Dre later brought in DJ Yella from the World Class Wrecking Crew, and Easy also recruited his homie MC Ren to join the group. So, that's how the classic NWA lineup was formed. The plan obviously worked because they dropped their debut album, Straight Outta Compton, the next year in 1988, which became an instant classic. No one had ever heard music that was so real and reflected what was going on in hoods across America. It was so controversial that the FBI sent them a warning letter over their track, Fuck the Police. But even though they were blowing up in the industry and selling millions of records, there were problems in the group from day one. The first person to leave NWA was Arabian Prince, who dropped out over contract disputes and unpaid royalties. He later said, I started off as a solo artist, so I was aware of what a royalty statement was. I knew that when these many records were sold, there's a quarterly statement. When you look at it, you can see how much money was paid and then share it. This was not the case. We were also never paid for touring. So, after that, Dre became the main producer while DJ Yellow was on the turntables, and Easy, Ice Cube, and MC Ren were the main performers. But over the years, more money issues started splitting the crew up. By the end of 1989, Ice Cube also dropped out of the group over royalty disputes. Since he wrote more than half the bars on Straight Outta Compton, Ice Cube believed he should get more of the profits. He also helped Easy write most of the lyrics on his debut album, but was only paid $32,000. The last straw was when Jerry presented them with the new contracts that were basically unchanged from the agreements they made when they were nobodies. Plus, Cube realized it didn't even confirm that he was an official member of NWA. But when he brought it up to Jerry and wanted to give it to someone else to look over, he started acting shady. So eventually, Cube felt like he had no choice but to walk. Even though Easy was the label owner, Ice Cube says he really blamed Jerry Heller, who was pulling strings behind the scenes. Cube later sued Jerry for unpaid royalties after he left the group and they settled out of court. Cube thought he left the group on good terms and didn't have any problems with any of the members, except Jerry. But things got real after NWA dropped their next EP, 100 Miles and Running. Cube had just released his first solo project, America's Most Wanted, a few months before and didn't even mention the drama with NWA. But on 100 Miles and Running, the other members took shots at Cube for leaving the group behind. On the title track, Dr. Dre rapped, It started with five, but yo, one couldn't take it. 
so now there's four because the fifth couldn't make it. Then, on the song Real Niggas, Ren took a shot at Cube rapping, only reason niggas pick up your record is because they thought it was us. Then Dre took another shot rapping, we started out with too much cargo, so I'm glad we got rid of Benedict Arnold. The dissing caught Cube off guard because he never wanted to smoke with anyone in the group. His decision to leave was purely business and nothing personal, but once they called him out like that, he had no choice but to respond. Cube released an EP called Kill At Will in December 1989, which featured the track jacking for beats where he took shots at NWA rapping, and if I jack you and you keep coming, I'll have you marching 100 miles and running. On the outro, I gotta say what's up, Ice Cube also shouts out all the other rap groups who are doing their thing. But in a recorded phone call at the end of the song, he gets asked about NWA and immediately hangs up. Even though they were light jabs, it was enough to keep the beef going and let fans know they still had problems. Easy e would also start taking shots at Cube in interviews, claiming he wasn't really from Compton and how he jacked his whole style to seem tough. Cube would also send shots back in interviews, adding more fuel to the fire. In May 1991, NWA would clap back on their second album, Niggas For Life, which featured several shots at Cube. On the track, Always Into Something, Dre called Cube, Bitch O'Shea, a reference to his real name, O'Shea Jackson. There's also an interlude on the album called Message to B.A., aka Benedict Arnold, which is what Dre called Cube on 100 Miles and Running. The entire skit is dedicated to dissing Cube, where Dre plays answering machine messages of different people making fun of him and calling him a punk. Cube heard the track and was obviously not happy, so he responded with one of the hardest diss tracks of all time. In October 1991, Cube released his second album, Death Certificate, which ended with the song No Vaseline. On the song, Ice Cube went in on his old crew and also accused Easy and Jerry of taking advantage of the rest of the group. He called out every single member of NWA and attacked them with vicious, cold-blooded bars and let them know how he really felt. He also responded to all the disses they made about him on Message to BA. Cube raps, you looking like straight bozos. I saw it coming, that's why I went solo. Kept on stomping when y'all motherfuckers moved straight out of Compton. You got jealous when I got my own company, but I'm a man, ain't nobody humping me. No Vaseline is now considered one of the greatest diss tracks of all time along with Tupac's Hit'em Up and Ether by Nas. After years of sending shots back and forth, Cube dropped a nuclear bomb and left the other side speechless. To add to the damage, right after he dropped the track, N.W.A. finally started to crumble. Even though he called Cube a Benedict Arnold for leaving the group, by 91, Dre was starting to have the same issues with the label. Even though the group was more popular than ever, Dre started getting frustrated with Easy over how he handled business. There were even rumors that Easy had been convinced to sign away their contracts to Jerry while keeping a split of the publishing rights for himself. So, Dre wanted out of the group. At the time, Dre had been hanging out with his new bodyguard, Suge Knight, who convinced him to leave NWA so they could start their own label, which later became Death Row Records. It's even been rumored that Suge and his goons jumped Easy e and threatened to kill Jerry Heller if he didn't release Dre from his contract. However it happened, Suge eventually convinced Easy to give up the contracts for Dre, the DOC, and R&B singer Michelle, who all left Ruthless to sign with Death Row. That put the final nail in the coffin for N.W.A., and the group split up so they could each focus on their own solo careers. But it also started a new beef between Easy and Dr. Dre that would get even crazier than the war with Ice Cube. Easy would go on to sue Dre and Suge for using threats to break their record contract. They eventually reached an out-of-court settlement and gave Easy a percent of Dre's production money and earnings as an artist, along with a cash payment. But even though Easy got paid by Dre's records, he no longer had control over the music. So, when Dre's debut album, The Chronic, came out in December 1992, it was full of disses aimed at Easy. The second track, Fuck With Dre Day, is a direct diss mainly about Easy, although Dre also responded to No Vaseline. The music video also featured a skit with Easy E and Jerry Heller lookalikes. Dre also took a shot at Easy on the song Bitches Ain't Shit, where he rapped, I used to know a bitch named Eric Wright. We used to roll around and fuck the hoes at night. It wouldn't take long for Easy to respond, and he would begin taking shots at Dre and his new artist, Snoop Dogg, in interviews. Easy brought up his past in the world class wrecking crew and made fun of him for wearing tight clothes and makeup. He said that Dre was never really a gangster and stole his whole style from watching him. He also said that Compton and Long Beach did not claim Dre and Snoop like that, and they were both portraying a fake street image just to sell records. He also followed it up with the diss track Real Motherfucking G's alongside his two new artists, Gangsta Dreista and BG Knockout. On the song, he went at Dre and Snoop for being studio gangsters and called the song Dre Day Easy's Payday. 
Easy kept applying pressure and released an entire EP dedicated to dissing Dre called It's On Dr. Dre 187 Um Killer. On the EP, Easy continued to mock Dre for his past in the world class wrecking crew and called him a phony. The album art even featured a fake newspaper article about Dre that listed his death as October 25th, 1993, the day the EP dropped. Apparently, Easy planned to drop a double album called Temporary Insanity, but after hearing Dre going at him on the chronic, he decided to scrap the album and record a project of disses instead. It proved to be a smart move because it went double platinum, making it the most successful release of his career. The Death Row Camp would also fire back on Snoop Dogg's debut album, Doggy Style, which included a few shots at Easy. But after that, the distance slowed down and the beef appeared to be cooling off. Dr. Dre and Ice Cube had squashed their beef and even began working on music together again. They reunited after Dre had called him up and asked him to work on a record called Natural Born Killers. So Cube drove out to the studio where he found Dre working on beats in the back room by himself. Even though it was awkward at first, they eventually put the past behind them and are still cool to this day. Cube had also settled his differences with Easy and was even trying to arrange an NWA reunion. Even though Easy and Dre still had their differences, the beef wasn't that serious and could still be squashed. But they would never get the chance to make it happen, as Easy E would be dead just a few months later. In February 1995, Easy got sick and went to the hospital with a serious cough. After he was admitted to Cedar Sinai Hospital, he was diagnosed with HIV AIDS. He told his fans about his diagnosis on March 16th, where he admitted to being in the biggest fight of his life. Sadly, he passed away just 10 days later at 30 years old. Easy was buried on April 7, 1995 at Rose Hills Memorial Park in Whittier, California. More than 3,000 people attended the funeral, but the only member of NWA to show up was DJ Yella. According to Yella, they all went to the hospital to talk with Easy and make up before he died, including Dr. Dre. They all showed up at the hospital, yeah. Okay, you showed up at the hospital? Yeah, I went to the hospital too. Dre came a little bit before me, an hour or so before me. Okay. And Q made it, made it came earlier that day. He still isn't sure why they didn't make it to the funeral, but Yella thinks maybe they just couldn't stand seeing him like that. I mean, some people probably just can't take it. Couldn't, you know, actually take it. You never know. You know, I don't know what the reasons they are. We never talked about it, even to this day. Even though they had their differences, even Dr. Dre admits that they would have eventually settled the beat. And if Easy was still alive today, they'd probably have new music in the works. We would probably be working together right now, Dre said in an interview. We would probably be arguing about the work as we did back in the past. It's like every project, we had some little argument about what the project should be creatively. And I would say we would probably still be doing that. But at the same time, getting the work done and probably doing something amazing. MC Rand also said after they reunited, everyone put all the distance behind them and never talked about it again. MC Rand said, when we got back together, it's like we really didn't even talk about it. It wasn't like we was in a room like, man, you said this, nah, but you said that. It was like, we just didn't talk about it. It's like a family argument where everybody's throwing stuff, fighting. Then the next day, it's like we all going out to kick it or something that nobody mentioned him the day before. So that's how it went down. We never really tripped off of it. Fans never got to see NWA make it back together, but the surviving members did link up to work on the 2015 film, Straight Outta Compton, which told the story of their come up. Even though the group was only together for a few years, they still made history and created a whole new genre of hip hop. Who knows what would have happened if they never started beefing, but whether they were working together or at each other's necks, NWA still created some of the most legendary music in rap history.